to ask you to come with me on a journey again, just or even at least think that you're going in this uh, time machine. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiyati a'malina man yahdihillahu falamudhilla lah wa man yudlil falahadiya lah wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh amma ba'd fa inna asdaq al-hadithi kitab Allah wa khair al-hadhi hadhi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharru al-umuri muhdathatuha wa kulla muhdathatin bid'a wa kulla bid'atin dhalala wa kulla dhalalatin fi al-nar a'udhu billahi al-samiya al-alim min al-shaytan al-rajim bismillahi al-rahman al-rahim يا أيها الذين آمنوا من يرتد منكم عن دينه فسوف يأتي الله بقوم يحبهم ويحبونه أذلة على المؤمنين أعزة على الكافرين يجاهدون في سبيل الله ولا يخافون لوم تلائم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله واسع عليم وقال عز وجل وما أرسلناك إلا مبشرا ونذيرا وقال سبحانه وتعالى وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين ثم قال هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون Respected brothers and sisters in Islam Dear friends, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I am privileged to be here today to address a topic which is of utmost importance in this day and age. The topic is the ultimate da'i, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That in his life, you will find the best model to follow. And it was his model which changed the face of this earth. When he appeared, when he was born in the Arabian Peninsula, the things were extremely difficult for the people living on the face of the earth. Pope Gregory the Great, writing in Rome, was complaining about the Lombards, that there is injustice everywhere. We cannot find justice on the face of the earth and divine intervention is not to be seen anywhere. Then we hear the complaints of the Jews in Spain in the year 633 CE, exactly a century later, exa exactly a year after the Prophet's death. They complain that where is the divine justice which will save us from the tyranny of the church? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anbiya revealed a fascinating verse, a very, very powerful, comprehensive verse. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we sent you not except as a mercy for the worlds. Now the mercy was manifested. The Prophet of Islam was born. Allah had conditioned him. Allah had chosen him to bring this mercy, to bring this mercy in this world so that people can live in peace once and for all. And this is exactly what happened. This is exactly what happened. What happened to the Prophet ﷺ? Who was this man whom I'm going to talk about today? Who was this person? Muhammad, an orphan, born in the year 571 CE. His father died six months before he was born. His mother passed away when he was six years old. His grandfather passed away when he was eight. Then he was given into the custody of his uncle Abu Talib, who took care of him for, who took care of him for 42 long years. And this man was not a professor. He was not a scientist. He was not 
an Egyptologist. He was not an embryologist. He was not a historian. He was not an archaeologist. Yet his book contains fascinating miracles of scientific, historical, and some powerful nature. So where did this all come from? Who was he? Why was he chosen for this job? He was 40 years old and he would contemplate in this cave, the cave of Hera, when an angel appeared to him and he told him that you are the messenger of God. The angel said to him, Iqra, read. And the prophet, being an unlearned, unlearned man, an illiterate person, he said, I am not learned. Ma ana biqari in. And the angel repeated, read three times. And then first five verses of the Quran were given, which were about knowledge. Iqra bismi rabbi kalladhi khalaq. Khalaq al insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuk al akram. Alladhi allama bil qalam. Allama al insan ma lam ya'lam. Knowledge, read. Learn how to use the pen. Learn and teach people in consequence. So the first verses to have been given to the Prophet of Islam were about the reality of knowledge and its importance. And as I will be talking about today, the da'wah of the Prophet Sallallahu you will realize how important the knowledge of Islam and the knowledge of this universe is for you to be effective du'at and why it is important for you to give da'wah. Because when you look at the example of the Prophet Sallallahu the kind of difficulties he faced in his life, the kind of sacrifices he gave, the kind of torture and terror he put his family into, just because of this message, you will come to realize that you are not doing anything you're not doing anything, you're, not, you're doing nothing. The amount of luxuries, the amount of comfort you have, the Prophet ﷺ couldn't even imagine it. He couldn't even imagine it. Anas bin Malik, radiallahu anhu, he narrates from the Prophet ﷺ from his life, that near the end of his life, when he was close to death, the Prophet ﷺ, he had his armor with a Jew as a guarantee to borrow some money from him so that he can feed his nine wives. Allahu Akbar, the Prophet of Allah, when he had conquered the whole of Arabian Peninsula, he doesn't have enough food to feed his wives. This is how he lived. Aisha radiallahu anha, she stated that for months, we didn't used to have fire burning in the house. In other words, we didn't, cook, we didn't, we didn't used to cook anything until Khaybar was taken. And Khaybar was taken in the year seven, just three years, old, three years before the Prophet Sallallahu death. This is how the Prophet of Allah lived because the burden which was put upon his shoulder, shoulders was a heavy burden. He was given this message in this cave and he runs to his wife not knowing what happened to him. He didn't know what this experience means. He goes to his wife and he tells her that this is what happened and she being a wise woman takes him to a man of scriptures, Waraka bin Nawful. And he tells him, namus allazi unzala ala Musa. This is the same spirit. This is the same angel who came to Moses. I wish I was alive on that day. I wish I will be alive on that day when your people will drive you out. My people will drive me out, says the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because anyone, anyone who came with this message was driven out by his people. And ulama, the scholars state that Waraka embraced Islam even before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam preached to him the ultimate da'i. He was put through many, many difficulties while he was giving da'wah fi sabirillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him when he was a 40 years old man, this is a time when you want to rest. You want to spend time with your family. You want to spend time with your kids. You want to go away from all the troubles and you want to take it easy in your life. And this is a time when Allah puts the heaviest burden on his shoulders when he was 40 years old. And then Allah tells him, Ya ayyuhal mudathir, Qum fa'andhir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, wa thiyabaka fa'tahir, wa rujza fahjur. O Muhammad, the one who covers himself, stand up, stand for the greatness of your Lord, warn people, tell them about the greatness of Allah, and then subsequently, in consequence, wali rabbi kafasbir, and then be patient, O Muhammad, because trouble will come your way. You will see many, many catastrophes and disasters coming your way. Be patient, wali rabbi kafasbir, and we will see 
what kind of patience he had to endure in due course. I will be addressing few contentions or few points to do with da'wah in his life. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the most sincere da'i, number one. Remember this. He was the most patient da'i. And he was the most dedicated da'i. And he was the most steadfast da'i. Nothing could shake him. Nothing, nothing could put him off from giving da'wah. All kind of strategies, all kind of ways, all kind of torture, persecution, abuse was used against him, employed against him, but it didn't work. And for him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and those who follow him, for those people, Allah put a verse in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in the Quran that those who say Allah is our Rabb and they are steadfast, they do not shake from that aqidah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends angels upon them and these angels tell them, they warn them, they tell them that do not fear, do not grieve because your abode is Jannah which was promised to you. These are the people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about in the Quran and Prophet was one of them and he was the leader in this regard and those who followed him such as Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Imam Abu Hanifa rahmahullah, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Bukhari, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah and the list goes on. There are plenty of examples in the history of Islam for us to look up to and the people of Da'wah. So he was the most sincere da'i. Why? Why was he the most sincere da'i? The Qurayshis, they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they offered him all kinds of things. Utbah bin Rabia was one of the elders of the Quraysh and they went to him. They couldn't find anyone better to speak to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and try to convince him to give up his message. Do not preach against our idols. Do not condemn our forefathers. Do not criticize us. We have an ancient way of life. We have a tra tradition which goes back in centuries. Do not criticize us. And then he goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Having been convinced by his companions, Abu Jahl and his likes, Utba goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he speaks to him. He tells him, Oh Muhammad, are you better than your father? Are you better than your grandfather? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was quiet, listening to him patiently. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, Are you finished? And he said, I am finished. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa recited the verses of Surah Hamim and he was shaken. And before he left, he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, If you have a need, you feel an urge, for money, for honor, for leadership, for influence, we will give you the leadership. We'll collect so much wealth that you will become the richest man in Mecca. You will be the top richest man from the tribe of Quraysh. And if you have a sexual urge, if you are looking for women, then we will find you the most beautiful woman in Quraysh. We'll give you 10 of them marry 10 of them and what did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say no no it is not about wealth and women it is about allah and his message it's been a long time coming but it's been worth it when you see what you can give to someone this small box can make a huge difference in the life of many people because of the contents of what's here, not just in terms of paper and ink, but the meaning and the presentation. I really enjoyed the clever way that this was presented. Something that I have not seen before, and yet it's as simple and as clear as anything you'd ever want. What a great way to put Islam in someone's hands. Well, don't just sit there. Order it.
And likewise, Rasulullah Sallallahu he was offered many, many times different things and he refused to accept all of those temptations. He was the most patient da'i. He was the most patient da'i. He had more sabr than anyone on the face of the earth. In fact, all of us put together. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith narrated by Anas bin Malik stated that I am a person who has a history of being afflicted with most severe punishments fi sabilillah. I am the man who has been afflicted with the most severe punishments fi sabilillah. Punishments or test or fitna. And I've been terrorized more than anyone fi sabilillah. Do you know brothers what I'm talking about? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa could not walk the street with peace. He couldn't pray in peace in the haram. There was a time when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was making tawaf around the Kaaba. Uqba bin Abi Mu'eed, having been inspired by Abu Jahl and his likes, came and put a cloth around his neck and he strangled him to almost death. He almost died, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was told about this and he ran to his rescue. Ataktuluna rajulan an yaqula rabbi Allah. Are you going to kill this man because he says Allah is my Rabb? Leave him alone. And Abu Bakr was fighting them physically and he was a thin man. Ashab rasul they state that Abu Bakr was so thin that his bones could be seen. His fingers, the bones were so thin that they could be seen. And he was fighting to rescue the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he was being strangled by Uqba bin Abi Mu'eed. The same man when the Prophet ﷺ was in sajda once in Kaaba, even though the, the Prophet was threatened, his life was in danger, he would pray in the haram to give da'wah to people, to inspire them about the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to remind them of, how, of the existence of Allah, and he would pray even though his life was in danger in public, in front of them, alone. And then Uqba bin Abi Mu'id came again, and he stepped on his neck. And he almost break, broke the neck of Rasulullah. It almost snapped. And then another time, Abu Jahl, he stated that there is a camel killed by so and so people who will go and bring the intestines and put them on the back of Muhammad when he's in sajda. And the Prophet was in sajda. And these people brought these intestines and they placed them on his back. And they were falling on top of each other, mocking him, laughing. And Fatima radiallahu anha, she runs to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to rescue. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stands up and he says, Allahumma alayka bi Quraysh. Ya Allah, you deal with the Qurayshis. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he stated in the hadith of Bukhari that I saw all of those individuals who were present in the well of Badr. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most patient da'i. He was patient in his da'wah. He wouldn't give up easily. The case of Hakam bin Kaysan, this was a man who was captured in a battle. And Rasulullah was speaking to him, giving da'wah. And he spent long time trying to convince this man. He wouldn't listen. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu was present. He said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me to chop this man's neck off. Because he is not, listen, he's a prisoner of war. And Rasulullah did not listen to Umar. He did not follow the advice of Umar and he continued giving him da'wah. And he spoke to him for a long time. And then Hakam asked the Prophet وسلم, what is Islam? What is this Islam? The Prophet وسلم, told him, it is just worshipping Allah and Allah alone. That's Islam. And he said, I embrace Islam. Ashhadu la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And then Rasulullah turned to Umar and he said, Umar, if I listened to you, this man would have been in Jahannam. He was a patient man, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The incident of Ta'if, most of you are aware of this incident. And you've heard about this incident many, many times from the A'imma, from the ulama. Let me remind you something about this incident. Every time, brothers and sisters, I read about this incident, it's like the first time. It's like I'm reading it the first time because the feeling of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I cannot imagine that feeling. I cannot put myself in that position. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went to the valley of Taif when his uncle Abu Talib died and the last protection in the city of Mecca was lifted. He had no one to protect him except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah had promised that Allah will protect him. But when it comes to people protecting him through Aman, there was no one. So he went to the people of Taif. 
giving them da'wah fi sabilillah, come to Islam. They refused. And they not only refused, they made long queues, long rows, people carrying stones. And every single step the Prophet ﷺ would take, they would stone his feet. Imagine, put yourselves in that position. What have you done for Islam, brothers and sisters? I am very sure, Allahu Alam, I don't know people who are listening to me right now. I'm very sure no one has been put through this kind of difficulty and this kind of torture. Rasulullah ﷺ, just because he preached to them, called them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every step he would take, they would stone his feet and his feet were bleeding. And they stoned him for a long time, brothers and sisters. And he walked and Zaid bin Haritha who was with him, he was trying to protect him and he was receiving all the stones. He was, the Prophet ﷺ was bleeding all the way. And did he give up da'wah? Did he give up? The angel of mountains came to him and he said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me to crush these people. And he said, I was sent as a mercy. Allah will send people from the backs of these people who will believe in me, who will follow my religion. And many monumental personalities, characters came from this very tribe, Banu Saqif, the people of Taif. And Rasulullah having been stoned while he's bleeding, went to a garden of Utbah and Sheba. It belonged to a Qureshi family. He rests in this garden. He sits there. He's trying to heal his wounds and he's trying to, he's trying to comfort himself. And a man comes to him. This is the last time that you will, when you will think of Allah. This is the last time when you will think of anything else. When you are injured, you're bleeding. Of course, unless you have a very strong Iman. Unless Allah has blessed you with a very, very deep, strong Iman, then you will be saying the name of Allah and you'll be remembering Him. But in most cases, people want to go to the hospital. They want to get treated. They want bandages on their wounds. But this time, Rasulullah this Christian slave comes to him, brings him water and grapes. And what does the Prophet ﷺ do? Does he, ask for, does he ask him to bring some, some, some cloth so that he can cover his wounds? No. Rasulullah ﷺ gives him da'wah. Immediately there and then, he speaks to him about Islam. He asks him, where are you from? He says, I'm from Nineveh. And the Prophet ﷺ sees an opportunity of da'wah and he says to him, the city of Yunus bin Mati. He said, how did you know that? The Prophet ﷺ said, I am a prophet of Allah. And Allah has told me about him. And then he recited the verses about Yunus in the Quran. And Udas, the Christian slave, immediately sat down and he started kissing the bleeding feet of the Prophet Allahu Akbar. He started kissing his feet while they were bleeding. And the Prophet was bleeding himself. And yet he was giving da'wah to this man. He was trying to say one soul, even though he himself was extremely afflicted. Allahu Akbar. He was the most patient da'i. He was the most patient da'i. He was the most dedicated da'i. Why? His dedication had no boundaries. He was never put off. And he told his companions to do the same. He said to Ali bin Abi Talib, when he was given the flag on the day of Khaybar, he said to him, for wallahi, لَإِنْ يَحْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَكَ حُمْرٌ نَعَمْ وَاللَّهِ By Allah, if one man is guided by you, Ali, listen to me, if one man comes to Islam because of you, it is better for you than the red camels. It is better for you than the red camels. Red camels were like the Ferraris of the Arabian de desert. You see, the way Ferrari is today, everyone wants to buy one, all the youth, they want to drive around in Diablos and Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Red camels are just like that. And the Prophet ﷺ told Ali that bringing one person to Islam is better than, better than red camels for you. And then he was so dedicated, fi sabilillah, that he came back from one of the ghazwa. And he had dust all over him. He was pale. And as soon as he entered the city, he went straight to the masjid to pray. This is exactly what he would do. And then he would go to his daughter's house, Fatima radiallahu anha. And then he would go to his wives. But this time when he went to his daughter, she opened the door. And as soon as she saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, she cried. She cried. She couldn't control herself. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, why are you crying, my daughter? Why are you crying? And she said, Ya Rasulullah, look at your face. Look at your condition. Look how dirty and old your clothes are. 
Look at your color, you're pale. You've lost so much in the path of Allah. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say to his daughter? Ya Fatima, la tabki fa inna Allah ba'asa abaka bi amri. Oh my daughter Fatima, do not cry as Allah has sent your father with an amr, with a deen. La yabka ala dhahri al-ard. There will not be a house made of hair, made of mud or made of cement in which Allah will not cause this deen to enter. So be happy, my daughter, do not cry. Allah has sent your father with a successful deen. Allahu Akbar. And then his uncle, Abu Talib, he was so dedicated that he never gave up. His uncle was dying. He was on his deathbed. And the Prophet ﷺ approached him immediately. And he wanted to speak to him. And he wanted him to come to Islam. And he went to him. Abu Talib was accompanied by some of the Qurayshis who were disbelievers. And they were telling him, Abu Talib, do not listen to your nephew. The women of Quraysh, they will laugh at you that Abu Talib, he was scared of death. While he was dying, he embraced the religion of his nephew. And Rasulullah sallallahu said to his uncle, Ya Amma, Qul la ilaha illallah, ashhad laka biha yawmul qiyama. My uncle, say la ilaha illallah, I will argue on your behalf with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Just say it. And Abu Talib did not say it. He said, ala millati, Abdul Muttalib, I die on the deen of my father, which was idol worship. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cried. He was so concerned about his uncle. He loved him so much that he cried. And Allah revealed the verse in the Quran. Inna ka la tahdi man ahbabta. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُحْتَدِينَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you cannot guide whom you love. It is Allah who guides people and he is aware of those who are guided. Allahu Akbar. He was very, very dedicated and he never gave up giving da'wah. There was a Jewish boy who should take care of him in Medina and he was dying. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rushed to his house to save him from fire and he sat next to him and he said to him, O oh my child, Say la ilaha illallah, say it. And he looked at his father. He looked at his father and then his father who was a Jew, he said, follow Abu Qasim, follow, listen to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said his shahada and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very, very happy and pleased. And he said, Allah has saved this soul from fire. Allahu Akbar. And he was finally the most steadfast of the du'at. He was the most steadfast da'i. The reason why I'm giving you these examples, brothers and sisters, so that you learn from his life how much we can do and how much we are not doing and how much comfort, how much capacity and the amount of wealth, the amount of power and influence we have in this country. And we're not using it, Fisabilillah. And Allah, and if we don't do it, as the verse very clearly state, stated in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, man yartadda minkum an deenihi fasawfa yati Allahu biqawm. Yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbuna. Oh, you believe, if you turn your backs on your deen, on your responsibilities, Allah will replace you with those who love Allah and Allah loves them. And these are the people who carry the flag of Islam and they struggle in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most steadfast da'i. And this is the final point. When the Qurayshis, threatened Abu Talib. When the Qurayshis threatened Abu Talib that your nephew is going too far. He is condemning our idols. He is condemning our ancestors. He is going too far. He is putting his life in danger and your life in danger. Abu Talib invited Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to come and speak to him. He said to the Prophet, I am an old man. Do not put a burden upon my shoulder which I cannot bear. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he thought that Abu Talib is trying to give up his support. And the Prophet ﷺ, while crying, shedding tears, looking at his uncle, said, Ya Am, Lo wudi atish shamsu an yamini, wal kamaru fi yasari, ma taraktu hadha al amr. My uncle, even if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I will not leave this amr. I will not leave this deen. Brothers and sisters in Islam, he was the most sincere, most patient most dedicated, most steadfast da'i in the history of mankind. There is no doubt about that. Once you study his history, his own daughters were put in trouble. His family was put through so many difficulties and none of you today would 
like to put your family in such troubles. His daughter, when she was migrating to Medina, she was poked by a man and she fell off the camel and she had a miscarriage. And this man was forgiven by the Prophet ﷺ. Wahshi, the man who killed his uncle Hamza in the battle of Uhud, he came on the day of the conquest of Mecca. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, how will Allah forgive me? How will Allah forgive me? You say that those who worship idols, that those who killed, who are murderers, and those who committed adultery will never be forgiven. What hope is there for me in Islam? Rasulullah responded to him by comforting him. The same man who killed his uncle and the Prophet ﷺ didn't love more than anyone. He didn't love anyone more than his uncle Hamza. Because he cried on the day when Hamza died and Hamza had three relations with the Prophet ﷺ. He was his uncle, he was his friend and he was his foster brother. Allahu Akbar. And this man who killed him was forgiven by the Prophet and instead he was given da'wah and he embraced Islam. So what was the consequence of this da'wah, brothers and sisters in Islam? What happened in the world? They were made to manifest this mercy. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa on the day of Hajjatul Wada, he said to his companions, take this message to those who are absent. And then they took this message to those who were absent. And this is why you and I are Muslims. This is why most of you can enjoy the fruits of Islam. This is why you can, most of you can listen to the Quran and cry. This is why most of you, you can take care of your children because you fear Allah. This is why most of you, you take care of your parents because you fear Allah. This is why most of you, you be kind to your wives because you fear Allah. This is why most of you wouldn't harm the society you live in because you fear Allah. It's because of this deen and the message of those Sahaba which was given by the Prophet and the mercy of Allah. You are the way you are. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ وجهت نظر قالوا العمى فقد النظر قلت البصيرة للبصر قالوا المحبة نقمة لا خير منها ينتظر وإن استمرت لا تدوم كبيت رمل في المطار قلت المحبة لا تموت بعاشق